joining us, John. Well, you're very welcome. I'm always happy to be on your show. Well, thank you. And and it's always interesting to talk to you, especially now that you have upped the ante on your bet. Uh, you famously said that you would eat a certain part of your anatomy if uh, Bitcoin failed to get to $500,000 by 2020. And you said that this summer, and I had you on, we talked about that briefly at the time. Yes. Now you have update, uh, up that to $1 million because it's rising even faster than you'd anticipate. What did you base this on? What assumptions and what kind of, give us an idea of what kind of analysis you use. Was this something that you did mathematically or is this just a gut feeling yeah, that you have? No, no, I, I am a math major and uh, mm -hmm. mathematics is, is my business. Uh, I'm a programmer. Um, it, it was based on some very simple assumptions. There can only be 21 million Bitcoins. That's the max. Four million of them have already been lost. So now we're down to 17 million. And we're, we're, we have the entire world that will be potential users. Now, when I made that prediction, I also predicted that it would be $5,000 before the end of 2017. Well, it almost peaked at $12,000 today. So yes. clearly my assumptions were, were way off. Now, I will not have to eat that part of my anatomy, I can assure you. Uh, <laughs> I am perfectly safe at $1 million at the end of 2020. See, here's the wow. problem. Everybody is making predictions based on the old paradigm of investment um, and, <clears throat> and growth, where 10% is astonishing. But well, we mm -hmm. get 20% a day consistently sometimes with some cryptocurrencies. Why? Because the supply is limited. We can't print anymore. Like you can print more US dollars. You can print more British pounds. You can print more Japanese yen. You cannot create any more Bitcoins and the maximum of 21 million. Now, if you take 21 million coins and let's say only half of the world <clears throat> ends up using Bitcoins, well, we've got two and a half billion people using 21 million coins. Please just use your head. $1 million mm -hmm. is nothing in three years, if I am correct. <clears throat> and I am correct. I don't make bets and lose them. This is, my wife can tell you that. She's holding the phone here. Um, <laughs> so it's an easy bet. It's something I can absolutely guarantee. <clears throat> now, since I said that, a bunch of people have jumped on the bandwagon, okay? Um, and <clears throat> why? Because I said it, and mm -hmm. I stand by it. <clears throat> and Bitcoin is accelerating in its value. Yeah, we've got a lot of people that are saying that they expect by the end of uh, next year, uh, quite a few people said forty, fifty thousand dollars. You're probably even higher than that in your estimation. If it's going to get to uh, uh, a million by uh, 2020, they're saying uh, forty, fifty thousand dollars by uh, the end of 2018 is what many people are expecting That's, now. No, my, my figures at seventy-eight thousand by the end of 2018. However, wow. what astonishes is people say we think Bitcoin is going to be fourteen thousand by the end of 2018. What paradigm are they using? <clears throat> they are using the old paradigm where you do have bubbles, where things do pop, where you do have corrections. The word correction cannot be applied to Bitcoin. That's mm -hmm. from an old paradigm. The well, I want to paradigm. talk to you about some of the stuff that is coming out. There's a couple of things that I want to hit with you. One of them is as somebody who is a... Uh, who's been there from the beginning in terms of cybersecurity. I want to talk to you about just uh, tips that you would tell people in terms of how to protect themselves against cyber theft. We'll get to that in a moment. But the other part of this, besides the limited number of coins that are there that are fixed in this uh, algorithm, is the fact that it is being pushed back against by uh, many governments. We now have the UK saying we're going to come in with a regulatory crackdown. We've already seen it in China. You're in Asia as well. You were there, and, and we saw what happened with that. Many different ways that you have central yes. banks and governments trying to attack. Many people believe that there was a, a, a direct denial of service launched against, say, Coinbase and uh, their, uh, their trading uh, site last week that caused that 
flash crash uh, from about 11,000 down to 8,500, but then it recovered. And we've seen the same type of thing coming from Jamie Dimon and the world's biggest uh, hedge fund manager, both attacking uh, Bitcoin. That had happened just the last, just before I talked to you the last time, and that had taken Bitcoin down from four to three thousand dollars, but then it recovered and about uh, lost about a quarter of its value, but then it recovered in just a few days. So we got these attacks coming from uh, the central bankers, from the investors, from the regular banking industry, as well as governments coming in to try to regulate this. But then still in China, it's still going strong. People don't realize how strong it is in Asia. That's why you're in Asia, right? And I know you got a cold. I, and thank you for joining us. We were going to have you on on Friday, and you were uh, very sick with the flu. So I really appreciate you coming on uh, today. So here's the problem. It does not matter whether governments like Bitcoin or not, whether mm -hmm. banks like Bitcoin or not. And I, I, yeah, I was on with Jamie Demon where when he was saying Bitcoin was a fraud. Well, it's clearly not. Jamie Demon is head of, of America's largest bank. Obviously, he's frightened. All banks are frightened. Mm -hmm. In five years' time, we will have no banks because everybody with a Bitcoin wallet will be its own bank. I can do wire transfers or the equivalent. I can, I can uh, do the equivalent of writing checks. Everything that a bank can do, my wallet can do. And this is the problem. Banks are looking at coin exchanges now. I have developed, in, in conjunction with Bit India in India, a wallet which is distributed. You cannot mm -hmm. shut it down. Mm -hmm. Hang on. We've got to take a quick break, and we're going to be right back to you. And I want to talk about the wallets and how uh, these people are trying to attack us. And, of course, you know, they came after Ross Ulbricht. That was one of the key things that they came after him for was because he was using Bitcoin in the early days, very early adopter of it. They saw that as a threat. They do see it as a threat. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to John McAfee, specifically about Bitcoin. Because John McAfee is a pioneer now and has been uh, for a while in cyber currencies as well as in Bitcoin mining. He was a pioneer decades ago in terms of virus protection software. So I want to talk to John about what is going on. Of course, uh, we talked in the last segment about his prediction of Bitcoin increasing, why he was confident of that, uh, says he had come about that by a mathematical analysis, not just a gut feeling. And when we look, uh, John, at what's happening here, this is something that is a global phenomenon. You're in Asia right now because that's really where the demand is the biggest. People don't realize that. We, we don't yes. really focus too much on news outside the U.S., but last week uh, it was trading up about $1,000 or so higher in South Korea and Japan. It was up over 12000 at that point. And people don't realize that about 74% of the global Bitcoin trades are from South Korea and Japan, especially in Japan. Uh, they're using yes. it uh, quite a bit in terms of, um, uh, we've now got you on the phone, let's see, uh, in terms of uh, quite a bit in terms of uh, actually purchasing stuff that's a threat to the central banks. And that's why there are so many efforts to try to undermine it. Go ahead. Yeah, so in September, I was supposed to give a talk in Beijing at BitCan, one of the largest uh, Bitcoin conferences. The week before, China shut down the exchanges and made ICOs illegal, which was this topic of my talk. Had I shown up, I would have been arrested. The wow. entire conference was moved to Hong Kong. Oddly enough, every keynote speaker that was to speak at that conference showed up in Hong Kong, and almost everybody who had registered. That shows the dedication. But let me get back to what we were discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that governments can do to shut down Bitcoin. Now, they could stop me from showing up in Beijing. I'm a human being. They could stop me at the airport and arrest me. They mm -hmm. cannot stop and did not stop trading in Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. It is impossible for a government to stop a distributed system like Bitcoin. <clears throat> and now that That's right. It actually that. went up, didn't it, in terms of the amount uh, of uh, yes. Chinese yen uh, buying a Bitcoin? It went up from 5 to, I think, to 20%. No. Then it went back down to like 13%. Yes. But it actually is still uh, two or three times what it was before they prohibited what it. What it was before. So mm -hmm. pro prohibition requires enforcement. How do you enforce people not using Bitcoin? You would have to have an agent for every citizen within your country. They would have to come into your house and monitor your computer usage 24 hours a day. It is not possible. You yeah. cannot enforce any of these bans. And this is what governments 
do not understand. <clears throat> Banks are more terrified than governments. Governments are going to lose revenue if they're taxing income. Banks are going to lose their entire business because mm -hmm. a wallet is a bank. End of story. So you, do you see the banks uh, trying to offer, and this is what a lot of people talk about, we see Venezuela is coming out and saying that they're going to offer a cryptocurrency. <laughs> Interesting enough, because in Venezuela, they're one of these states like Zimbabwe and others where people are uh, trying to flee the com uh, country with their capital. Uh, that's been one of the things uh, that is so attractive about something like Bitcoin. And so now they're trying to come out and say, uh, we're going to run, run a cryptocurrency for people. I think that's too little, too late for Venezuela. Uh, well, but well, uh, I, I, other countries have talked about going into competition with Bitcoin like China and Russia as well. Yes. But you cannot, because these cryptocurrencies that the governments are offering are centralized. It's mm -hmm. just like things are now. They have central mm -hmm. control. They can control the price. They can control the fluctuations. They can control interest rates. No, Bitcoin is not centralized. It belongs to the people. It has taken power away from centralized governments and banks and given that power to the people. When a government issues its own cryptocurrency, <clears throat> they're missing the point. They're simply taking that power back. Are you going to accept that? I'm not. Go ahead and issue a, a, a cryptocurrency. America, England. I don't care. I'm not going to use it. I'm going to continue to use Bitcoin. That's right. And, and then when you look at efforts like uh, China and now being reported uh, UK, as a matter of fact, last week, some reporter... Uh, pitched out a question to President Trump. Uh, what about Bitcoin? Well, we got Homeland Security looking into it. If China, <laughs> if the United States, if the UK try to put restrictions on people taking money in and out, we still have places like Japan that are going to, or Switzerland, that are going to run into this and say, uh, embrace it, and people will still be able to get their money in and out uh, through those currencies, wouldn't they? If they wanted oh, absolutely. to. Absolutely. And again, the exchanges are now moving to distributed wallets. There is no more central exchange in the new paradigm of Bitcoin. Exchanges, you, you will be part of a distributed exchange. If someone shuts you down, it's not going to shut the exchange down because the exchange is spread across millions of nodes, millions of users, millions of wallets. So there's nothing technologically, legally, legislatively that can be done to stop or even impede the growth of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Now you're talking about some a distributed wallet. That's something that uh, many of us don't know about, including myself. Tell us a little bit about a distributed wallet and how's that, how does that compare to like say a hardware wallet where uh, the keys and everything no. reside on a, a separate uh, device? When I say distributed, I mean wallets that are including a distributed exchange. Instead of having an exchange which is located in one country with massive servers, that exchange is now distributed among millions of users of the cryptocurrency. So you cannot take it down. The exchange mm -hmm. process itself, if you want to exchange Bitcoin for Ethereum, there is no central exchange. It's done with everybody's wallets communicating simultaneously. It cannot be taken down. It cannot be located. It does not exist in any one location. It is an idea made manifest through millions of people accepting and embracing the idea. So when that happens, give up governments. End of story. War over. People won. Government lost. That's a great idea. Now, in the past, you've talked about... Uh, the necessity, and, and we've heard it as well from uh, Kim.com, the necessity to have some kind of uh, a replacement, perhaps, for the Internet uh, that would allow us to escape the uh, the approaching centralized control that the government's <coughs> always trying to exercise over this. If something like that were to come up, uh, it would be easy to move the cryptocurrencies over to that uh, exchange as well, wouldn't it? That, that course, new Internet. And there are thousands of people working on this, and it will happen. And the mm -hmm. Internet itself will then become distributed, starting with some local nodes where you're in a town like Lexington, Tennessee, where I am. And everybody in that town has a local Internet connection between each other. And then that town will connect to the next state. And then one state connects to the next. And one country connecting to the other. All of them decentralized, no central control, 
no owners, nobody is the boss of that internet. And it's coming. We all know it's coming. That's great. That That's, I think, the real hope of humanity. Not that we're ever going to be able to audit the Fed. Not that we're ever going to be able to be uh, able to shut down it or central banks, but that we would transcend it with uh, new technology, with new cooperation, as we're doing with Bitcoin, that as the government and as these big multinational corporations like Google and Facebook, these constructs that work with the government, as they start to exercise control, as they start to take away our freedom of speech, our freedom to exchange information with other people, that we have these new constructs that come about that will replace the old DARPA-designed uh, Internet that we have that the government has been yeah. working on decades to try to take it down. Yes. All right, we've got to take a quick break. Yeah, we've got to take a quick break. We're going to be right back. We're talking to John McAfee. Hey, folks. David Knight, and we're talking to John McAfee about cryptocurrencies. And we're going to talk about some other cryptocurrencies besides Bitcoin. But before we get to that, John, I want to ask you about one more thing here. And that is uh, something that was brought up in a um, an article on Zero Hedge talking about the fundamental values in terms of a storage of wealth. And by that, they mean people will store values in high denomination paper money. And in the same way, people are storing money in Bitcoin. Uh, it's, you know, we see the investment speculation that's going on there, and that's the noise that we see on top of all this. But at the bottom of that is the basic way that you use money, and that is, of course, to buy and sell things, but as a, uh, a, a way to store wealth and to transport it to other countries. I have a uh, feeling that a lot of the unrest that we're seeing in a lot of these third world countries, whether it's Zimbabwe or Venezuela or maybe even in Saudi Arabia, a lot of that uh, may be driving people to put their money not in $100 bills uh, that can get quite bulky to move around, but in some cryptocurrencies. And they point out yeah. that if you look at the total value of what's out there, they say about uh, $1.1 trillion of $100 bills that are not counterfeit in global circulation. If you add in the counterfeit stuff and everything, you're probably about $1.7 billion. So they look at it and they say, right now, Bitcoin's share of that portable storage of wealth market is about 8%. And all cryptos combined, it's only about 15%. They said if Bitcoin were to go to 20,000, there would only be 14% of that market share. If it were to go to 100,000, that would only be 33% of that. So that's an important part of this, isn't it? It is indeed. And, and I did factor that into my calculations. Now, let, let's talk about value. <clears throat> what is the value of a $100 bill? Isn't it just the paper that it's printed on? That's right. I am, yeah. I'm a, my company, MGT, is one of the largest uh, Bitcoin miners outside of China. It costs me almost $2,000 to create one Bitcoin. Wow. One Bitcoin. That's in electricity costs, <clears throat> management costs, costs of machines, amortize. So I know the value of a Bitcoin because we work hard to create them. So what's the value of one Bitcoin? It's got to be at least what it costs me to create one. What's the value of a hundred dollar bill? Five cents worth of paper, possibly, and ink. <laughs> that's right. So, and a decision by the Federal Reserve Chair to decide, yeah. hey, let's print some more of these yes. things. Yeah. Let's print some more of these things. Yeah. So let's talk. There is real value to cryptocurrencies. It takes work and time, electricity, software, and a lot of intelligence to create one coin. So Surely I must think there's value in it, else we would not spend the money to create these coins. Sure. So there is inherent value just in the work, the proof of work, to create a single coin. All right, let's talk about some of the other cryptocurrencies, Jim, because you're, you're pointing out that this is a... You talk, they, they have the uh, metaphor of mining because it's really work that has to be done. And when we look at all these wild fluctuations, we understand that on top of the monetary aspects of these cryptocurrencies there is speculative investment people like to say well you know the tulip bulb bubble or whatever or talk about the real estate bubble that we had in the early 2000s but of course that was created by who the federal reserve the government the banks yes. and so forth they try to they don't talk about that too much they always want to go back to the tulip bubble thing because that's too close and that shows that they were the ones who created that bubble and burst it. Let's talk about the other cryptocurrencies, because when you talk about the fact that uh, we have um, a limit to the number of uh, Bitcoins, 21 million, four of them have disappeared, so that leaves us with 17 uh, million of those. Uh, the other part that would uh, come in in terms of, you know, we're not 
not going to be able to have any more of that in terms of gold, but we could have other cryptocurrencies. How does that, uh, how does that uh, work into the whole calculation here? Well, there are, there are thousands of cryptocurrencies now, literally thousands. Uh, mm -hmm. The top are things like Ethereum, Litecoin, Monero. Of those, Monero is the one that, that needs to be watched the closest. And here is why. The dark web is where Bitcoin first got its use. If you wanted to hire a hitman to buy illegal drugs, to get a live tiger uh, from the jungles of Asia, you would pay <laughs> in Bitcoins, all right? Mm -hmm. Now it's 100% now it's Monero. Why? Mm. Because Bitcoin can be unwound with enough computing power and enough will, like if the FBI wanted to, they could find out who a person was in the specific transaction. That's right. Monero, go back to the blockchain. They could go all the way back to yes. when you first got into yes. the system. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. But with Monero, it is impossible. Utterly mm. impossible. It is completely anonymous and completely private. So that is why in the dark web, everybody's using Monero. But what I have discovered is what starts in the dark web in terms of cryptocurrencies leaks out into the world of light, the world of above board business. Because all people, I believe, all people would like to have anonymity and privacy That's in right. terms of their financial transactions. And yes. if I'm right, then Monero bears watching very closely. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you look at uh, what's happening now. You have uh, Coinbase and others now require that you send them pictures of your driver's license and so forth. So we're, we're getting, you know, the government regulations in that way to, to in, in the back door. And I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of value and people are realizing the value of privacy and anonymity whether or not they're involved in anything that the government wants to do. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's why they yes. came after Ross Ulbricht and Silk Road uh, so heavily. You know, the coins, I just saw an article uh, from Free Thought Project, the coins that they stole from Ross Ulbricht and uh, uh, Silk Road are now worth $1.74 billion. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is. And they did steal them. They did yes. steal them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Ross Ulbricht is, is, is a special case. I do not think that that's going to happen again. Because Bitcoin has now almost universally been accepted as, okay, it's above board, it's open, it is a currency, people are using it, and, and you're not going to stop it. Monero, yes. when Monero hits the, hits the light, and, and it has in many cases, uh, we're going to have a serious problem with governments because there's nothing, nothing that a government can ever do to determine who is doing what. And this scares governments, obviously. It does That's not scare me. I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. That's great. That's great. Well, and, and you know, that, the only thing that, that I'll be concerned about, and I hope it does succeed, I see them coming after people like Ross Ulbricht. I see them coming after people like Kim.com, just like they came after Martha Stewart or Michael Flynn. They get somebody that they want to punish for political reasons or they want to make an example of. And uh, that's that's the key thing there. So, um, so Monero is what you're looking at now as uh, most optimistic in terms of cryptocurrencies because it provides a different level of anonymity that they cannot walk back like they can walk back the blockchain on Bitcoin. Is that correct? That's correct. And if Bitcoin does have a competitor or will have, it will be Monero. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, that's valuable information that people can take to the bank. You know, one of the things that they were talking about in this Free Thought Project, and I'm sure uh, you would appreciate this as well, John McAfee, they, they were saying that when you look at what was happening on the dark web, you look at what was happening on Silk Road, People were able to buy drugs from their living room rather than getting out on the streets. Uh, they were going through, uh, it was basically like eliminating all the negative side effects of prohibition, which is what I have a problem with it. I don't support drug use, but prohibition has its own set of of problems in terms of corrupting law enforcement, in terms of crime and criminal gangs that are fighting each other. And what it did was it turned it into a peaceful market of exchange. You still had the drug problem that was still there. Uh, but these other activities that were regulated uh, unreasonably, prohibition never works, whether you're trying to prohibit marijuana or beer or something else, it never works. It just creates crime. It creates corruption in government. And so the benefit of that was that it made things more peaceful. And they came after him for creating a website. Your comment on that. Giving well, life first, in prison, multiple first, life I, in sentences. First, I would like to say that it is impossible to regulate what a person chooses to do with their own mind and their own body. 
It has been proven yes. over and over. If you want to drink alcohol, prohibition is not going to stop you. It's just going That's to right. make it go underground and cause problems. If you want to smoke weed, if you want to take any kind of drug, you will do so. Nothing can ever stop it. And we should have learned this. Legislation does not work when it reaches the point of what you want to do with your own body. That's right. Well, I think the uh, this has been a very hopeful interview. I think anybody who is of a liberty mindset, a libertarian orientation, who wants to see privacy, who wants to see anonymity, who wants to be able to escape these oppressive control uh, control structures that are centralized, and as they're trying to now uh, increase their control over our free speech, our ability to uh, pass information along, all these things, Bitcoin, alternative web uh, structures, uh, that is the wave of the future. And that is, I think, the greatest, most hopeful thing that I see that's developing right now. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It's been very interesting talking to you. And thank you for joining us. I know that you're not feeling well. And I really do appreciate you making the extra uh, effort. Who is McAfee.com? And you can find John McAfee on Twitter at Official McAfee. Thank you so much for joining us, John McAfee. You're welcome, sir. Thank you.